Hi, welcome back to the shack. I wanted to take a look at the Model 28 transmitter distributor unit and what it is and how it works so that we can understand it a little bit better in order to diagnose what might be the problem with this particular unit. First of all, the transmitter distributor nomenclature is what Teletype calls their paper tape readers. And what this machine does is it reads a paper tape. Paper tapes like this one that have five level Bado codes punched in them. This happens to be a chadless tape. It has these little flaps over the holes, but it'll also read fully perforated tapes. And Model 28 is the line of equipment that this particular unit is in. And it's the line that all of my teletype uh, equipment is in. You'll sometimes hear me call this an LXD, um, and that is the teletype model for this particular piece of equipment. The L stands for Model 28. All the Model 28 equipment starts with L, and XD stands for Transmitter Distributor. So if I say LXD, this is the piece of equipment I'm talking about. This is the unit itself with the cover taken off with, uh, and some of the guards taken off the inside and many of the fasteners so that we can get through what it is and how it's put together pretty quickly. So it has four major units. The first one is the base with this electrical unit over here. The second is the motor right here. The third is this transmission in the middle. And the fourth is what I would call the LXD itself, which is just this little box here on the end. And let's go through those in order. First of all, the base here is mounted to, and this particular unit is mounted to a, a sheet metal base with feet, and it's rubber mounted. I don't know if you can see the flexion there, but it's rubber mounted to keep the noise down. And it has an electrical unit here on the end. Uh, that has all of the wiring uh, between the portions of this unit come out to these, these terminal strips on the end. It has the power switch, power cord comes in, and the signal goes out. And I want to point out that this unit does not have an internal fuse, and I believe that is correct. I believe they do not have internal fuses. So you got to watch that. It could burn something up. Now the motor does have uh, an overheat sensor in it, so if the motor is getting hot or shorted, it, it should shut off. But uh, if there were a short somewhere else in this unit, it, it's not fused. On the base, we have mounted the motor itself, and this unit right here, as you can see, is a separate unit that's just connected by the power cord for the motor and the gearing into the rest of the unit. And uh, this is an LMU, which is the Model 28 motor unit. This is the same motor unit that is in all of my Model 28 equipment. Now, there are several motors available. This happens to be a synchronous AC motor, which is what all of mine have. There is also a DC governed motor available. And for this particular unit, there is a much, much smaller synchronous motor that allows it to be mounted on a smaller chassis. The third uh, sort of component of this that we talked about was the the transmission here in the middle and what this does is it reduces the motor spindle speed which of course in the US for a synchronous AC motor is 3600 rpm down to the operating speed of the L, uh, of the LXD and that operating speed will change based on the the baud rate of the baudo that you wish to send and this particular unit is 45.45 baud, and that shaft, I believe, runs at 300 RPM. Uh, so in order to run a different speed, you would change out this gear, I think this pinion, and, and then uh, the, the gear on the other side of the shaft would rotate at a different speed, causing this to operate at, at a different baud rate. So now I'm going to take the uh, LXD off of the base. We'll take a look at the underside of it and how it connects. It's kind of clever. Um, and then we'll get this other stuff out of the way so that we can look at the LXD itself. So there are three screws that hold the LXD to the base. They're already out. And it just lifts off like that. And if you look on the bottom, it has, this is all of the electrical contacts for the LXD. And it looks a little bit like a Centronics connector. Um, and it just dogs into this connector down here, which floats in the base so that this can uh, alignment can be governed by the actual mechanical uh, drive here. And it also has a switch here that would cause it to power off when the LXD is removed from the base, although that is not functional in this particular unit. So let's get this other stuff out of the way and take a look at the LXD itself. So here's the LXD itself uh, taken out of the unit. And um, this is the face that has all of the controls on it that you would use. But its normal operating position, it would sit like this with the tape feeding in from the right and falling off uh, to the left. 
So the controls on the front, we have the, the run stop lever here that's in the stop position now. Flip it down to run the tape or flip it up to freewheel the tape. You can just pull it out of the machine with this uh, flipped up. It disengages the drive wheel. This button here, which was originally anodized red, but the anodizing is almost completely worn off, opens the, the tape cover here. And this tape cover just holds the tape down against the machine uh, for reading. This little lever right here is a tape tension device. If the tape is under tension, for example, if it's feeding out from something over here that's, that is not writing uh, fast enough or has stopped writing, the tape goes under tension and pulls this up, which, which disables the uh, LXD from transmitting so it doesn't tear the tape. And then these little guys right here serve to, to hold the tape in position as it reads up and over the unit. So you would place the, the tape in here over this little drive wheel, close the gate, and then it runs uh, up through there. And these guys serve to center it. Now these grooves right here, if the tape is printed with the characters that are on the tape, it will be printed six spaces behind the holes that encode a particular character. So if it was a quick brown fox tape and it started with the, there would be uh, a T punched in holes, and then six characters later on the tape, there would be a T printed on the tape uh, in ink. And what you do is you line the character that you wish to send first up with these markers and then run the tape and it will transmit it. So the next thing to see here is this wheel right here, uh, which is the tape feed wheel. And if we look at it from the side, uh, it has a bunch of little round ended pegs on it. And these fit through a row of holes that run just off center on the tape and are used to guide it through the machine. So this, this wheel right here controls the speed and the spacing uh, at which the tape goes through the machine and the holes are read off of the tape. You can also see in here a set of pins. Right here is three and then two more on the other side that rise up out of the machine. Let's see if I can get one to rise by hand. A little hold, hard to get a hold of, but they rise up out of the machine in this direction and poke out of little holes in the face when the machine is in operation that sense whether or not there's a hole in the tape in that position. They rise up with very little force, and if they strike the tape, then they're held down, and if there's a hole in the tape, then they push through, and that indicates whether there's a marker space at that particular bit position in the Bado character that's being read. So at the other end of those pins that we just looked at are what are called the transfer levers. And the, you can see the tips of the transfer levers here and they actually have a little bracket that goes around this right here which is called the transfer bale. And depending on the position of the sensing pin, the transfer levers are allowed to move one direction or the other which allows this transfer bale to rock back or forth depending on whether or not uh, it's decoding a mark or a space. There's an extension on that piece which you can see right here which is called cleverly the transfer bale extension that comes out the side of the unit right here. And this right here, this device right here is basically a detent for that transfer bale uh, extension to cause it to snap either into one position or the other position. The other thing that's driven by that transfer bale is this lever right here which goes into this box. Now this box is what's called the signal generator. And what's in this box is just a little switch that makes or breaks on one side or the other depending on whether the transfer bale is in one position or the other. So we can see it rock back and forth right there when I operate the transfer bale extension. And so if I can get the cover off of the signal generator. Note that this says, do not oil on the top of it. It's about the only thing in a teletype unit that's not full of oil. We can see this switch right here that rocks back and forth. And you can see the contacts inside that switch on one side and the other. And one of these uh, sides will, will allow current to flow through the loop. It looks like this side from the wiring. And the other would break the current so that it does not flow through the loop depending on whether this switch is in one position or the other. Or this transfer bale rather is in one position or the other. And so that's how the LXD works. That's how it reads the tape. Uh, it The shaft rotates 
and once it's tripped, it senses each of these pins in a row with a cam on the bottom of the unit, and as it senses those pins, it allows this transfer bale to tilt one direction or the other, which moves the switch in the signal generator to either the mark or the space position. So let's look at the operation of the LXD sort of from the outside in. So what happens when this device is, is triggered, it's triggered electrically by the operating switch being in the run position and the tape out indicator being depressed. And that causes this selector magnet over here to pull an armature that trips the clutch. And we'll look at where the clutch is and how it's tripped on the bottom here in just a second. But when that clutch is tripped, these pins protrude from the front. And as I mentioned before, they don't have, their springs behind them are, are relatively weak. And so they're actually stopped by the paper and prevented from uh, extending. Then the clutch rotates and we'll look at that from the other side, sensing each of these pins in turn. So here we're looking at the underside with the drive mechanism, the clutch, and the uh, sensing mechanism for those uh, tape sensing pins. And here's where the drive comes in, and it rotates all the time, constantly while the machine is on. But as you can see, the rest of the mechanism is not doing anything, even though I'm rotating uh, this drive gear. And that's because of this clutch mechanism right here. So the clutch that we tripped before is on this arm right here, which is driven by the selector magnet in there. And when it's pulled and it trips the mechanism, it releases this clutch right here so that the drive gear is engaged to the shaft that goes across the bottom. Then as this shaft rotates, it has a series of cammed surfaces that lift these levers one at a time. And you can see it's lifting this lever right here. Let me get it at an angle where you can see across the levers. It's lifting this lever right here. And then it lifts the next lever, the third lever, the fourth lever, and the final lever. And then as it reaches the end of its travel, it additionally, well it's already done most of it, retracts the pins right here back into the mechanism and rotates the drive wheel so that the next character is positioned under the reader. Now, if you work on one of these and you take it apart and you, and you run it by hand, when you're done, you need to push this little stud right here until it clicks and this lever falls uh, to disengage the clutch so that when you put it in the machine, the clutch is not engaged. Now what these bars that it lifted are, are actually sensing bars that ride against the rear of the pins up here. And they are what allow or prevent the transfer bail mechanism in here from rocking back and forth to actuate uh, the signal generator. Now let's take a look at it in operation. Uh, and again, this isn't the normal operating position. Ordinarily the operator would sit on this side of it, but this allows us to see what's going on from this side uh, as, we, as we try it. You can see the motor here has a fan on the end and the motor is spinning. It's spinning this direction. The shaft in the uh, uh, LXD is spinning in this direction, in this direction as we saw. Um, and. Uh, We'll go ahead and feed a tape into it. Now this isn't this data isn't going anywhere, but we'll just see how it operates. Um, and we'll try to get a close up on the pins here, although I'm not hopeful that they'll be very vi uh, visible on the video uh, because I'm only taking 30 frames a second. I had some problems when I tried to do 60 frames a second uh, on YouTube. So here we go. There's the tape running. The pins jump in and out. And there hopefully you can see the pins at least lifting the flaps, if not uh, their actual operation. But as you see this tape being an RY, RY tape, you see the three pins run and then two pins run uh, in between. Next thing we'll look at is the side of the unit and you'll be able to see the uh, transfer bale extension here in the transfer bale stabilizer popping back and forth. You won't be able to see the inside of the signal unit because I did cover it up. Unfortunately, we can't see in, into this uh, under this plate here because this plate serves to align the pins, so I had to take the, or I had to put it on as well. But we will be able to see the transfer bale stabilizer, and then we'll try to get a shot on the inside uh, of the transfer bale itself going back and forth.
There, get that thing shut off and unplugged so that there's no more exposed mains wiring uh, on the back side back there. So let's now talk about the things that I thought might have been a problem and why I thought they might be a problem. The first is the uh, fingers here that read the tape, the pins that jump out and, and, and back in. Now, as I said, the springs on them are pretty light, and if some of them are sticking, which is possible if they're under lubricated or if there's some gunk in the mechanism or whatever, and I did spend quite a bit of time cleaning out the inside mechanisms here, so it's possible that I dislodged some gunk or that I uh, moved something or whatever and caused them to, to not uh, go in and out quite as fast maybe as they're supposed to, which could cause a problem. And the second thing that I thought might be likely was that the timing was off. And we talked about that in the previous video. And the timing is basically dictated by this transfer barrel stabilizer mechanism here, this detent right here, and the position of the signal generator box. And one reason that I thought that might have been a problem is that when I cleaned this, I removed these screws here. These screws are what fix the signal generator box in position. And when I cleaned it, I removed them one at a time, cleaned under them, put them back, took the other one off, cleaned under it, and put it back. Uh, but it's possible that I moved the signal generator when I did that. And the way that's supposed to work is you loosen those until they're friction tight. And then this right here has an eccentric on the back, has a cam on the back. And you use it to sort of push the signal generator box one direction or the other to change that timing just a little bit by changing where this lever falls in its neutral position and how far it has to move to go from mark to space to change the switch inside this box. And uh, it turns out I'm not so sure that's the problem for a variety of reasons that we will talk about later. But it looks like someone had been here before me. If you can see, these screws are a little bit boogered up and I didn't do that. And the screws that mount this to the base are a little bit boogered up as well. So somebody has had this apart and been looking at that um, and or has been adjusting the timing there. And maybe it was just routine maintenance, but maybe it was someone searching for timing problems um, themselves. The, the real word on that will be when we look at the signal that's actually coming out of this and the timing of that signal and uh, determine whether or not it's correct. So that's the Model 28 transmitter distributor. That's what I've learned about it, how it operates, and where I thought the problems might lie, and where I think the problems may still lie. So uh, keep watching. Hopefully uh, here in the next week or two, we'll, we'll get some timings out of this thing and try to figure out um, why it's not functioning and how we can fix it. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please click like, uh, subscribe to the channel, and uh, follow my adventures.